What international law standards were violated by Azerbaijan and what mechanisms are available to hold them accountable? Servicemen and their families encounter many problems in the social services sector. Specialists propose solutions. As a consequence of the four-day military operations launched by Azerbaijan in April, a number of international law standards were gravely violated, including the prohibition of the use of force, armed operations against civilians, disrespect of the bodies of the deceased, including mockery and mutilation, and so on. Astrid Karapetian has analyzed these offenses and the mechanisms of assigning responsibility in these cases. Details in the report. Aggression is an international offense which the Charter of the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over. Persons who launch aggression are subject to criminal responsibility under international law. <laughs> One of the most important principles of international law was violated, which is the principle of the prohibition of the use of force, which is reserved in the second article of the UN Charter. Azerbaijan violated this principle, which prohibits solving disputes through force or threats to use force. Attorney Mariam Zadoyan, member of the Armenian Lawyers Association, refers to the 1949 Geneva Conventions on Protection of Victims of International Armed Conflicts. The civilian population as such, as well as individual civilians, shall not be the object of attack, acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population are prohibited. However, as you already know, Azerbaijan has even threatened to bomb Stepanakert. A number of other important provisions reserved in the Geneva Conventions were violated by Azerbaijan, namely those concerning the use of prohibited weapons and the treatment of peaceful civilians. It's written there in black and white that peaceful civilians must not become military targets. Moreover, weapons which are indiscriminate by nature, meaning those which do not select and destroy specific targets, should not be used. Some of the weapons used were indiscriminate and could cause damage not only to soldiers but also to peaceful civilians. We witnessed examples of this during this four-day war. Attorney Mariam Zadoyan also stressed that children are to become special subjects of protection during military operations. However, as it is known, on April 2nd, 12-year-old Varinak was killed by a Zeri missile shelling on his way to school. State parties undertake to respect and to ensure respect for rules of international humanitarian law applicable to them in armed conflicts which are relevant to the child. Ms. Zadoyan also speaks of the inhumane treatment of the deceased servicemen and peaceful civilians' bodies. Prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated. Any unlawful act or omission by the detaining power causing death or seriously endangering the health of a prisoner of war in its custody is prohibited. In particular, no prisoner of war may be subjected to physical mutilation. Meanwhile, the bodies of the 18 deceased that were returned to Armenia had been subjected to mutilation and disrespect. As an example of respectful treatment of prisoners of war, the attorney recalls a photo that became famous after the Nagorno-Karabakh war in 1994. An old Azari woman who was held captive is hugging war veteran Sarkis Hatspanyan, thus showing gratitude for his kind treatment. As for the responsibility for the crime committed by Azerbaijan, specialists note that it is possible to apply to the European Court of Human Rights as well as to raise the issue in the International Criminal Court. It is just that neither Azerbaijan nor Armenia is a member state of the International Court Charter. However, this doesn't mean the International Criminal Court doesn't have the authority to respond. There are cases in which the United Nations Security Council applies to the court to initiate criminal prosecution. Thus, charges are filed against individuals who have ordered or manifested aggression. The four-day war on the border of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic proved that, apart from the need for more and better efficiency military equipment, it is also necessary to pay greater attention to the servicemen's socioeconomic situations. Specialists on this subject note that there is much yet to be done, what problems exist and what solutions are proposed. 
Details in the report. Attorney Norai Norikian is confident that the social security sector for servicemen and their families needs to undergo radical changes. I don't want to go too much into details, taking into account the peculiarities of these days, but you won't be able to find an officer who, so to speak, doesn't have ever-growing loan commitments in trade banks. Therefore, the state must enforce aggressive policies which will make it possible to solve officers' social and economic problems, starting from housing conditions and children's health care problems. According to Marat Atovmian, a member of the Armenian Lawyers Association and the head of the Yerevan Anti-Corruption Centre, the state needs to legally provide servicemen and their family members with adequate living conditions. According to the law, in cases of previously registered or retired servicemen, persons with the right to receive a disability pension and family members of those who perished during military service have a right to receive an apartment or a piece of land adjacent to the house bought with public funds or to receive equivalent financial support to acquire an apartment. In addition, according to the head of the Yerevan Anti-Corruption Centre, the centre has received complaints from different officers and servicemen regarding corruption risks in this sector. They reported directly during all conversations that they had encountered some manifestations of corruption in this process, wherein some officials were to pay for the apartments. However, since they had no evidence, they just reported this information orally. In attorney Nora Norikian's opinion, even though it is written in the law, in black and white, that the servicemen's health problems are solved with public funds and free of charge for the servicemen, the reality turns out to be the opposite. Comes. There is a limit. When that limit is passed, the state refrains from financing. I have had such problems myself. It is when the officer was in a situation where he couldn't be fully cured, taking into consideration the fact that the state did not have enough means to solve his problems. Mr. Norikan is sure that the military and medical order of compulsory military service gets strict every year, and recruits with very serious health problems are conscripted to the army. According to him, here are the roots of the problems of army combat readiness. It would be wiser not to conscript 3,000 recruits with health problems. A month after conscription, they are moved to the hospital. I have encountered cases where they were just kept at the hospital for several months and were discharged afterwards. I don't want to go too much into details, but the resources that are wasted in that field just to ensure the number of conscripts should be channeled at solving the social and economic problems, the salaries of the professional army and more professional soldiers, so to speak.